Hello everyone. I hope you all are doing great. The topic for today's session is Cloud Native App Development 101. So this session is going to be uh, for a beginner's level audience and it will just touch upon the basics on how we can pursue the app development journey in a cloud native manner. Uh, before we dive right into the talk, I would like to introduce myself to the audience. Uh, my name is Avni Sharma and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work in the OpenShift Developer Tools team and I'm really passionate about cloud native technologies. Uh, so my Twitter handle is 16 Avni Sharma and you all can connect me on Twitter. So let us now see what's the agenda of this talk. We have uh, basically four major components uh, which would be taken forward. Uh, the first one being discussing about cloud native. So yeah, since we are taking it from a very basic level, I would first like to demystify what cloud native is, why do we need it, uh, how to actually adopt cloud native um, paradigm. Um, the second one would be focusing on the key concepts or the characteristics of being a cloud native technology. And out of those key concepts, uh, the one concept that I would like to stress upon and I would like to even demo further would be containerization. So everything around a microservice architecture and how do we get uh, an app in a containerized format? And that would uh, be demonstrated with the help of a small demo. So as cloud is becoming so pervasive in the IT field and there's a lot of digital transformation going on, we have adopted new way of building and deploying apps. And that is typically cloud native. So what is cloud native? Elaborating on what I just said, um, it is quite apparent that cloud native has two distinct words. One is cloud and one is native. So when I say cloud, it means uh, apps residing in the cloud instead of traditional data centers. And when I say native, it means apps designed to run on the cloud. And it is designed in such a way that it utilizes the characteristics of the cloud that is elasticity and distributed system of the cloud. So it's there, it exists there, but to leverage it and to use it to its full potential and advantage is basically cloud native and it is an approach to build and run applications. It is a set of systemized techniques and methodologies. That's it. So there is a foundation which is known as CNCF. And if you go on CNCF's GitHub pages, you will find a very crisp definition of cloud native, which is cloud native technologies empower organizations to build and run scalable applications in modern dynamic environments, which can be public, private, or hybrid clouds. So whenever you uh, listen about cloud native or you attend conferences about cloud native, you will often hear about CNCF. So what is actually CNCF? CNCF stands for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I also have pasted the link to their site over here. So CNCF is part of the nonprofit Linux Foundation, and it seeks to drive adoption of this cloud native paradigm that we're talking about. And how does it do that? It does that by fostering and sustaining an ecosystem of open source vendor neutral projects. So you might have heard of uh, Kubernetes and many such projects which come under CNCF. So all these projects help us in, in driving our cloud native methodology and to adopt cloud native in a very easy and friendly manner. So I encourage you all to visit their site and uh, the community is really friendly and you can also take a look at the projects that are housed under CNCF. 
So yeah, this can be pretty overwhelming. This is a landscape of all the projects that come under the CNCF foundation. And you can see here's the Kubernetes. You have so many etcd, code DNS, Prometheus, Rook. So there are many, many, many projects. And as you can see, the list is endless. So uh, I won't be going through all the projects. I've pasted the link uh, below the image and I encourage folks to visit the landscape page once. So the uh, key concepts that I would like to discuss in this talk are these four concepts. I know there can be many concepts and the definition for cloud native can be as diverse as the community. I feel these four um, really drive the cloud native methodology and the idea of cloud native. So the first one is DevOps. So DevOps is basically building, testing, and releasing software rapidly and consistently. So DevOps is the whole journey of your application, of your code, from its development to operations, hence DevOps. So it's not only about building a running code, but it's also about getting it into production. How do you get it? You test it, you release that software, everything comes under DevOps. Continuous delivery is faster and reliable delivery of products. Then I have uh, containers, which is basically isolation of apps. And it is packaged app. Uh, that means one unit of the container can have code and the runtime related to that code, dependencies, etc. And how can we achieve a microservice architecture is actually through containers. It's uh, that is how we achieve my, a microservice architecture. And when we say we want a microservice architecture, it means we want loosely coupled apps. So the benefits of cloud native app. Uh, the first one I can tell is that a cloud native app is engineered specifically to run in the elastic and distributed nature required by the modern cloud computing platforms uh, that we discussed uh, in the definition of cloud native as well. And since these apps are loosely coupled in um, the cloud environment, so it's really easy to manage, to scale them on demand. We can scale them up or down and thereby we can influence the cost performance mix and keep up with the changing and growing demand. So all these are benefits of cloud native app, uh, which wasn't really possible in your traditional way of dealing with uh, applications on cloud. So why to adopt cloud native? I think I have pretty much summarized it uh, in the previous slides when I said, uh, what is cloud native and what are the benefits? So it pretty much summarized on why do we go ahead on adopting this paradigm or this approach. Uh, but to summarize it ahead in a single slide, I would like to say that cloud native will provide with these three as an um, umbrella of stuff, which is speed, agility, and resilience. So with speed, you know, the productivity increases as operations gets easy. We know we can adopt agile methods, we can have DevOps, we can have continuous delivery patterns. So it will uh, influence the speed uh, and the productivity will increase and operations will get easier. Agility, we talked about loosely coupled apps, containers and microservices, which I would be telling um, in more uh, detail in coming slides. Uh, but basically all these loosely coupled structures or loosely coupled apps, loosely coupled services will provide us the flexibility to have app portability. And as I, as I mentioned, we can uh, scale on demand and it will actually help in ease of management. Resilience, uh, we can recover from failures, we can minimize downtime and build uh, reliable systems. So the third point that comes to our mind now is, okay, we know what is cloud native, uh, we know why do we need it, um, and hence we know the benefits, but how do we go about adopting cloud native? 
because it can be really challenging. We know the benefits, but it can be sometimes challenging to think about on how to adopt cloud native. So I would just summarize it in three broad uh, structures. I'm not going again in uh, minute details, but the first two I will discuss um, in the coming slide. So first one is microservice architecture, and uh, hence we are relying on containers, and uh, we have to adopt uh, agile methods. Agile methods is basically rapid and consistent releases of your um, application, the whole application life cycle, and everything needs to be of an agile model, which would be covered by DevOps and continuous delivery parts. But my focus for this talk would be basically on uh, building containers and a microservice architecture. So whenever I talk about microservice architecture, I always compare it with the traditional way of uh, building and deploying apps, which is through monolithic architecture. So monolithic versus uh, microservice architecture. So on the left, you can see a monolithic architecture, which shows that our app is really in just one unit. It is so tightly coupled such that one sector of it fails, the whole app will collapse. And that is something we don't want. If that happens, our day as software developers is doomed. Whereas on the microservice architecture, if you see, uh, everything has been loosely coupled. It has been disintegrated. And uh, if one thing fails, the whole system will not collapse and we have time to recover. And similarly, since it is loosely coupled, we can have as many uh, microservices we want uh, depending upon the load. And we can also get rid of some, so uh, on-scale demand, uh, on-demand scaling, I'm sorry. So all these can be taken care of in a microservice architecture. So the loosely coupled um, model of this architecture is something that uh, Cloud Native is uh, you know, helping us to uh, take forward. And monolithic can be really um, cumbersome. Uh, there are cases when you want to use a monolithic architecture, but I'm sure in production, you would prefer microservices. A monolithic architecture you can use for uh, you know, making a POC for your code or anything like that, but definitely for production, uh, microservice architecture is the future and it is happening. To elaborating more on microservice architecture, uh, we can see over here for an example use case, we have account service, book service, order service. So suppose we take order service over here. So this is being used by my uh, by requests coming from my mobile app, from browser. So one functionality can be used uh, with by being called from multiple APIs. And how microservices actually communicate with each other is like a basic uh, REST API. And you also see that uh, the Business capabilities has been demarcated and has been isolated. So account service will manage account service, book service will manage book service. Nothing is clubbed into one section. Everything, every business logic can be one microservice. So that is the flexibility that we want. And since every business logic is independent of itself, it's highly maintainable and testable, and uh, you don't need to depend on uh, the service. If you're making an X service, you don't need to depend on the Y service. You just need to hit the API if you want to use the Y service, and that's that. So this loosely coupled architecture is something that uh, we want to take forward and understand more. So since uh, it is all independent, loosely coupled, we can deploy it independently also. So microservice is an architectural style to develop an application to a suite of small services. So we can see the adoption timeline, how it, uh, you know, microservices came into picture and how it is being adopted. So first we had mainframes, which was centralized. Then we had in 90s, we had the client server distributed model. 
and then we had internet and internet really changed uh, the game of all of this and then we had cloud and with cloud we have um, infrastructure as a service platform as a service software as a service and after after we had this we we came up with cloud native and one of the one of the pillars of that would be microservices which is granular reusability and we are using it still so we read about um, microservice architecture having loosely coupled uh, services the so one app uh, is then bifurcated into different services so uh, containerization is how we can achieve that um, architecture style so let us now see a, a example of a virtual machine and containers so when I say everything can be loosely coupled, many of you can uh, come up, uh, you know, with a virtual machine as an option. Well, uh, virtual machine can be really heavy. And over here in this diagram on the left, you can see a typical virtual uh, machine virtualization uh, diagram. Over here, there's a hypervisor. And on top of it, we have three VMs. And so if we want three apps to be running, we would be having three VMs. And that would be really heavy. And each VM is having a guest operating system as well. So for one app, you're having one guest operating system out here in virtual machine. Whereas in containers, if you see, uh, we don't have the guest OS here. We have the con container engine, which would be, uh, you know, something like Docker, Podman, or any anything like that. But uh, you don't it, it's pretty lightweight uh, so containers is preferred more and all these containers would be on one linux kernel and so this is a uh, really lightweight and your containers will have your application code and related binaries libraries dependencies so how containers work um, with virtual machines, we have a whole guest operating system spinning up, uh, but with uh, containers, you can, uh, it, it's preferred to say that containers are just Linux processes. So it is just a process and it use all the Linux kernel capabilities like namespaces, um, C groups, C comp, tech comp, and many more. So uh, containers are basically a uh, process so let us now look at the steps uh, which will help in building our container so the first thing is a container image so a container image is basically an immutable file which will consist of all the executable code and the required runtime environment libraries dependencies for that application which we need to run so that would be in the container image and it's an immutable file so you cannot change it you can make a new container image with a new version but you cannot change an existing one so you can think that image that i mentioned in the previous slide uh, which we call container image is the recipe and container is the cake Container would be the running instance of the container image. And from where can you get a container image? So container image is stored uh, in a repository kind of place, which is known as a container registry. So like you store your uh, code in, on GitHub. Similarly, you can store uh, and push your container images to a container registry, for example, Quay, um, Docker Hub, Google Container Registry. And these container registries can be public and private and wherever you want to configure them. So now container runtimes. You, you want to manage the life cycle of your container, that is you want to run a container, delete a container, and build a container or push a container to a container registry. So all these can be handled by your container runtimes and uh, they will manage your container images. 
And the examples for container runtimes is Docker, RKT, Podman, ContainerD. There are many more. So for my demo, I would be using Podman, but you can use almost all the commands as is, like using Docker, and you can replace uh, the Docker command with Podman. Uh, so I have installed Podman on my machine. You all can use Docker as well for the demo. Uh, so Podman, as I discussed earlier, is a tool designed to uh, make it easier to create, deploy, and run your apps uh, using containers. So we discussed about a container image, a container which is a running instance of a container image. Uh, but how do we make that image? So how do we have that immutable file which will become a, a running instance of a container? Uh, so for that, we have Docker file. The Docker file is basically a bunch of commands uh, that a user could have called on command line to assemble an image. This is a sample Docker file. And here we can see we are taking the base from Ubuntu and we are copying the current directory, the contents of the current directory in the container image in slash app path. And we are running this make. And uh, whenever I want my container to run, I want this app.py to run as well. I would encourage the audience to go ahead, uh, look at a bunch of Docker files, because I know at uh, the very beginning, it can uh, not be really uh, apparent. So I would uh, want people to go and read about. Uh, how to make a Docker file and to read about containers because that is uh, really important for achieving microservice architecture. So whatever uh, I discussed in the previous slides of creating and running or pushing container images, I would like to summarize it in a bunch of steps. So the first one is to have a Docker file with you. So in the Docker file, you can have your commands, and steps for creating uh, your container image. So Docker file has all the steps. Now container image is the immutable file or the recipe with which we can make a container. So now, we once we have container, it's the running instance of the image. That's that, our app would be running once we run the container. If you want, you can also push your container image to a container registry so that anybody can pull your image and use the same recipe to run their containers. So it's demo time and uh, I would be referring one of the examples that I have pushed uh, on GitHub. So the audience can go to this link and follow the example uh, with me. So this is the uh, demo that I would be demoing for today's talk. Over here, I have mentioned from where you can uh, install Podman and it is a daemonless container engine for developing, managing and running OCI containers on a Linux system. Let us go ahead and start implementing examples and just see what a container is, how to build one, and how to get one running. So I have Podman installed. So you can build the container image with Podman with this command. And what this command does is that it will uh, build your image from a Docker file. So let's go ahead and see what the Docker file contains. So if I haven't mentioned any file name and I have just mentioned the current directory path, it means that whichever file has the name Docker file, it will take that by default. So you can see I have multiple Docker files, but uh, to specify a particular file, I will have to use a F flag, but uh, currently I'm going by the default Docker file. So here you can see that I have taken the base OS as Alpine latest. 
And here are multiple configuration steps. I'm configuring Go and I'm including a curl command because I would be using it in my container. Here I'm making a directory and I'm running basically the commands that would have that I would have run on my terminal as a user. And I have made a working directory over here. I'm copying the current contents of my folder into this path and I will go build uh, the app. So let me show the app that I'm going to build in my container. This is a very basic Go app and uh, I would be doing a call on uh, localhost to see whether I get hello world and uh, this is the path for getting Kubernetes as the output. So this is the app that I'm going to build in my container and let's go ahead and run this command. So let me just uh, name this as OSS demo version one and username. Uh, so I'm using Quay.io as my container registry. You all can use any other container registry that you will want. So I'm just writing my uh, username over here, which is Ami16, and I will build my um, uh, image which whose tag so uh, hyphen t is basically known as the tag so this is the tag that my image will get query.io on the 16 oss demo and uh, dot meaning take the docker file in from my current directory and i'll just hit enter so you'll see there are so many uh steps and for every step you will see different hashes so what is happening is that every line in your Docker file uh, is being saved as a layer and by every layer, I mean that every layer gets a SHA and that's basically a tarball. So your image is basically a tarball and you can literally uh, untar it and you can check the contents in it. So containers are uh, processes, so don't get afraid of them. So my image is being built and it says step 11 commit query.io and this is the SHA of my image. So let me just check podman images. Oh, I should have deleted the previous images. Anyway, uh, so you see that one image was created about 16 seconds ago and uh, this is the tag that I gave to my image and tag is given by hyphen T uh, flag. And the image is query.io slash of me 16, which is my username and demo OSs. You can give any tag. Uh, this is what I prefer. So now you see if you are a Docker user or for those who would be using Docker, it requires sudo, but here I didn't require it, which is pretty cool. So uh, now let me just show you all the Docker file. And here you see that this entry point has been commented and uh, I haven't given the entry point. So now I have to manually go and I have to run the app of, from within the container. Uh, so I should have given the entry point, but it's okay. I'll try to run the container now with this command. Okay, let me just take the image SHA, I prefer taking the image SHA, but you can take the name as well. So 
I'm telling to uh, run my container uh, because now I have the image, so I need to run uh, my container, which would be a product of that image. So run it in an interactive IT shell and remove it after it has been it has run and it is so the app is running as as you might have seen it's in this path and this path had been mentioned in the docker file so you can modify it as well and all the current all the uh, files and everything from the current directory has been copied in this container so if you see uh, everything is present over here so my container is there and you can also see that the container is running through this command and you see that this container is running so i i basically took the container image reference and i ran it for a container so now let us we have a running container we know it's ideal let us now ssh into it let us now go inside the container and uh, run our app interactive container so here i am and uh, i will run my app go run this is the go command to run it i had also configured the go path the go route in my docker file so you can see how to configure go uh, from the docker file that i have mentioned so so my app is running and uh, now you can actually curl uh, local host and you see over here hello world has been prompted so my container is running and i tried to curl which uh and my app ran so it is pretty cool so let me try another endpoint um So, ahoy, Kubernetes. Okay, cool. This is really awesome that our container is running. So, this is case one when I did not mention the entry point. And that is the reason why I had to go inside my container and manually run the application. But if you want that the app starts running whenever I get my container running, I can mention entry point in my Docker file. And that is what I would be doing in my case two. So over here, I would be building another image, uh, which is uh, given over here, the command. And I would be using my custom Docker file ex dot expose. So over here, I would be mentioning the entry point as well as exposing a port number. So let us just uh, exit from here. exit from my container okay let me now build a new container from oops sorry Try it. So this is my Docker file, and let me just go ahead and show you uh, the Docker file dot expose. So I'll just come to the expose uh, part of the Docker file. Here I have mentioned the entry point. So if you remember, I was doing a 
go run for a step, I can now do it easily. Yeah, let us go and build it. So now let's just go and see if my image was built. Okay, I have it here. Try it uh, with V1 version. This is the tag. This is the image ID and it says it was built seven seconds ago. So let me just have this image ID over here. And run podman run the container and hyphen p at and image so what is happening over here with the command so what happens we all, we also had the expose uh, command in our docker file so if you see that expose will allow communication between containers and other containers in the same network but it will not allow communication of containers in one network with uh, your host machine. So uh, what do we do in that case? Yeah, so in order to permit that, uh, you need to publish the port, which is done by hyphen P. So what we are saying is that the container port, which is 8080, needs to be published to my host machine port, which is 8081. So it's like right to left container port to my host machine port. Okay, so my app is running. And if you see uh, that it got created three seconds ago. Uh, so now let us just call the command without, you know, SSHing into the container. So let me just curl into it. And so, yeah. Here you see that hello world was printed. So basically, I mentioned the entry point. I published the port so that from my host machine, I can access um, the API. And now I can see hello world. So how cool is that? This is really great. OK, cool. So now the next case three is uh, using Kubernetes. So imagine a scenario where you know you have many containers, not one. You're dealing with um, many containers, and uh, what would happen if several containers start dying? Uh, how will you monitor it? Uh, what if you need more replicas of one uh, container? And who would basically watch the current state of the containers and get it to the desired state? This is not something which uh, you know the podman or docker will provide it will provide your containers life cycle that is to build create run or push a container and a bit of network management between containers in the same network but what would happen in a case where you need to orchestrate uh, your containers and get multiple containers from a current state to a desired state so to orchestrate them and to bring them into harmony uh, there are various orchestrators and the one which is very famous and uh, has graduated from CNCF um, and you might have heard of it, it's Kubernetes. So I haven't prepared a slide on it, but I thought that I can just run through an example and uh, due to the interest of time, I wouldn't be explaining each uh, manifest file or the artifact that has been used in Kubernetes. I will just show you how it works in a demo and I would encourage you all to go ahead and uh, look this uh, example files and uh, go through it. And if you have any questions, you can open up an issue. So yeah, let me just check if my mini cube, which is a single node cluster for Kubernetes is running or not. So I already have it running. You can do a mini cube start to get it running. So now I will first uh, create a namespace. So to create a names namespace, we can use the Kubernetes client, which is kubectl, and uh, create 
a namespace which you can say OSS demo. So now my namespace has been created. OSS demo. Okay, so my context uh, has been modified to OSS demo. So now I am in that namespace and I will just apply my deployment YAML. So a deployment YAML will get my um, pods up and running and the smallest unit uh, would be containers. So a pod can have many containers, but it is advised that one pod has only one container. So now I have my deployments running. I am using an alias for this big command and I have used an alias K. So if you see my demo server is running and it has been 18 seconds since it was launched. So let me just show my deployment YAML. Here you can see uh, that it is using containers in the spec. And I just showed how to build a container uh, from a Docker file, how to build an image and how to run a container. And you can push the same as well. And there is a command to push your uh, image. And once you push it, so you can use podman push command and your uh, basically image name. And you can push it to uh, your registry and you can give the reg the path here that's itself like query.io and username and image name. So what would happen is that it would go and populate here. Uh, suppose my username was of me 16 and it was query registry. It would get populated here and you can check your images. So yeah. I will just show how to get the same example that I was trying uh, on containers and how to get it on Kubernetes. So I have my deployment. Now what I will do is I will apply a service. So my service is created, which is demo server and the node port has been exposed. So yeah. So now I can do the same curl command. My app is running and I have uh, mentioned it in this image. This image has been pushed and my deployment is basically pulling that image from a public repository. So I can show you that this is pushed over here as demo. This is my image demo. You can see the tag is v1 since I had given v1. Okay, so now I will see my single node cluster IP, which is this. And then I can curl. My node port would be this. And this is not static. There are ways to make it static. Uh, but currently I'm using port of type node port for this example. I'm not going into the depth of explaining the YAML, but you all can go to this um, GitHub repository and check the example. So you see now it is coming hello world. So um, the app is working perfectly fine. If you want to try another endpoint, it works as well. So yeah, that was that for the demo and uh, Thank you all for attending um, the talk. And thank you, uh, Open Source Summit, for having me here. I'm open to questions and feedback. And by the time uh, I'm addressing questions, I encourage folks to scan the QR and you can submit uh, your questions and feedback uh, on the link, which is there in the QR. So thank you all and have a good have a great day. Bye.